Yeah. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, thank you to John for inviting me. I uh, gave a talk at NAMA a couple years ago, and so it's going to be kind of similar to that. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on in Colorado and talk a little bit about how we as a community can better understand the fungi in our awesome state of Colorado. Um, it's at height. So there we go. All right, so um, John went over this a little bit, but how I started in fungi was in my undergrad degree, I um, looked at the root pathogen armillaria. So you know, this is maybe the honey mushroom and it's a pretty prevalent root pathogen. And at that time in the early nineties is ripping through campgrounds in Colorado. And so if you're sleeping in a tent and a place with a lot of root rot and it gets windy, it can be kind of scary. So the Forest Service is trying to map these root rot pathogens to keep people safe from getting squashed in their tents at night, right, while camping. So for that project, we um, sampled these armillaria, and my portion of the, my job was to culture them, and then they went off and got sequenced, and they made little maps of the genets, and they were trying to, um, over here, you can see those maps where they were trying to map how this fungi was spreading. So they were trying to determine was it through spores? Were they moving around? Was it through root contact? Um, were there other different mechanisms? And they basically found all different methods of moving through space and time. And as John mentioned, I then went to San Francisco State University to study the mushrooms of Southeast Asia. And in that, um, uh, there's Dennis Desjardins. He was my master's professor. And there we are, all students wrapped with him, regaling us with Southeast Asian mushrooms. And through that experience, I was able to meet a lot of really amazing mycologists. So pictured are a lot of his Southeast Asian students. And in addition, we've got uh, Ruben Whalen, who is now deceased, and his wife at the time, Anamika, um, who are amazing mycologists from Belgium. And then up in this upper picture, we can see Aegon Horak and his wife. So that was a, just a tremendous experience to cruise around Southeast Asia and combat leeches and all kinds of tropical things that we don't get to experience in Colorado um, and just amazing myco diversity. And as was referenced, I studied Tetrapyrgos. That was my genus that I was looking at. And here in the middle, you can kind of see all the microscopic characteristics that are um, characteristic of these merasmialoid type mushrooms. So this is a little saprotrophic genus that has this really pervacious stipe that's really ornamented. And so if you start to look at those microscopic structures on the stipe, they have all these crazy little patterns on them. So under the microscope, they become really spectacular and in the top middle, what we can see is they have these really cool tetrahedral spores, and that's where that name comes from, tetrapyrgos, tetra, four-sided. Um, we do have a couple of these in North America, but I've never seen any of them in Colorado. There's uh, Niagara Peas on the West Coast and then Subdendrophora on the West Coast. And then for my dissertation, I looked at this stock puffball telostoma. And um, on the right-hand side, you can see SEM images of the spore morphology. And if you look at a telostoma, they're not really spectacular, right? There's drab kind of stock puffball. But if you look at the spores, they have amazing spore diversity. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, before we go on, I just want to point out um, some things that I really like about the mycological societies that we have in North America. So if we look at the Colorado Mycological Society website, it's an organization of professional amateur and citizen mycologists, which is just a tremendous group to come to. And I wanted to point out this word amateur because I, I love it because it means to love. So we're all here for our combined love of mushrooms. And I also want to point out one of the missions of the Colorado Mycological Society is the protection of natural areas and their biological integrity. And so to be able to appreciate that, we should know something about where we live, what we know about Colorado. And I also want to point out is in this, sorry, I can't see the cursor on my screen, but here it says 600 and Ed told me tonight there's over 1200 members. So 
Good on you, you guys. Your membership is exploding or mushrooming. All right, so Colorado ecoregions, let's talk about where we live. So ecoregions are um, these areas that are defined by a set of parameters and basically they're biological aspects. And there's a lot of different things that go into defining an ecoregion or the components of it, soil, moisture, elevation, but a, an easy way to distinguish these ecoregions is by the vegetation. So we'll, we'll briefly just touch on some of these ecoregions that we have in Colorado. So we have the Wyoming Basin in our upper northwestern corner, and it's a broad intermountain, intermontane basin. It's dominated by arid grasslands. It's surrounded by forested mountains. And in this area, it's extensively used for livestock grazing, which is kind of funny because it's not really supportive of that. So there's not sufficient resources. Um, the forage isn't that great. There's not a lot of moisture. And then in this area, we have a lot of natural gas and petroleum fields and resource mining. And if we go a little further south, we get to the plateau. So that's where we have our canyons and mesas and there's mountains around the edges of it. And if we, if you've ever visited this area, you know there's there's these massive, massive cliffs in there. And what's really cool about those cliffs is they're they're very tall. And so you can actually see the geologic history of Colorado in those cliffs. And we've got shrublands at lower elevations and some pinyon juniper and some gamble oak woodlands at a little bit higher elevation. So taken together, this whole western area of Colorado is dominated by the sagebrush steppe. So we've got these diverse um, grasses and small annuals, um, a bunch of different brush type things like sagebrush and rabbit brush, and then some more tree species at higher elevations, things like juniper, gamble oak, mountain mahogany. And then in some places, we might even see some more coniferous species like dug fir. And those are places that are holding more moisture. So in this area, um, fire suppression and erosion have allowed the woodlands to kind of expand beyond their natural range or historic ranges. And then with the grazing that's the putting pressure on these areas, we're gonna see invasive species coming in, things like Russian thistle, cheatgrass, and hal haligaton, which is toxic. And so these are some of the what these landscapes look like. So sagebrush, we've got canyons, we've got um, Rattlesnake Valley, Valley with those amazing arches. We've got the Gunnison River. And so um, this is kind of the diversity of those habitats on that western slope there. And then we get into the southern Rockies, which is why most of us probably live here, right? It's the mountains. And in the mountains, we see this uh, vegetation elevational gradient. So in the lowlands, we see grasses and shrubs, sage type things. And then as we move up, we're gonna see dug fir, ponderosa pine, aspens, maybe some juniper oaks. As we get higher, we're gonna see coniferous forests. And then at our higher elevations, we'll see the alpine habitats. And right, this is, this is why we live here, these mountains. Interspersed in the this whole Southern Rocky Range, we also have these really cool habitats. Like we've got uh, Taylor Park here, which is this awesome open broad park. And then we have other sage lands interspersed within these mountain habitats. What's also really cool about Colorado is that we have the highest density of volcanoes on the planet. Obviously, these are not active. These are ancient volcanoes, but this is Wheeler Geographic Area. So in this area, more volcanoes than there are anywhere else on the planet. And then on the Front Range, we also have this really cool area where they're finding all this uh, mammalian fossil diversity. Um, and this is in Coral Bluffs. So if we move a little bit further south, we move into the Arizona, New Mexico plateau. And this is this really interesting transitional region, especially for Colorado, it's distinct. And it's the San Luis Valley, if you've heard of that. So it's the upper end of the Rio Grande Valley and it's bordered by all these mountains. So what's really interesting about this habitat is it's the lowest annual precipitation in all of the state but it has this very, very high water table because all those mountains drain into this area. So it cr creates this really kind of special place with these ephemeral lakes, high water tables. So we've got wetlands and springs. There's a lot of um, agriculture happening and then some really important migratory bird habitat in that area. 
Um, and that's what this looks like. So just these open plains there. And then we move east to our high plains. So they're higher and drier than the habitats to the east, lots of croplands. It's the northern limit of the winter wheat um, and the southern limit, limit of the spring wheat and dominated by grass fields. And over here, we also see a lot of um, oil prospecting. And that's what this habitat looks like. So kind of these rolling grasslands. And then finally, to the south of that, we've got these tablelands. So we've, we, we see mesas, um, some more cropland. We've got grasslands in there. And then um, above the grasslands, we're going to see some juniper scrub um, on the escarpments. And so that's kind of what that habitat is. So we just kind of took a tour through Colorado and the different habitats. Now let's move on to the climate. What forms our climate? Um, we definitely have seasonality. I'm from Florida where we don't have seasons. So we have four distinct seasons in Colorado and Crested Butte. The other seasons besides winter are very short. They might only last a few days, but winter, we're getting towards the end of it. So how winter works here is the snow is coming in from the West, from the Pacific. And it, when it comes off the Pacific, it has all that moisture. So when it hits the mountains, all that moisture is getting dumped. So that oftentimes the western slopes of the mountains are going to have higher precipitation. And as it comes over, we get this orographic effect. So the air has lost its moisture. So the east side is much drier. In the winter, the storms are pretty strong and fast moving. Um, so we saw a lot of that this winter. So dumping snow on the western slope. And by the time it gets kind of over to the Denver side, all that moisture is gone. Um, so with the low temperatures, we have low water vapor, so um, we get this dry, low moisture precipitation, and that's where our Colorado dry snow comes from because of that low temperature and low water vapor. Um, and so the majority of snow usually comes from a few big storms. We don't usually have a consistent amount of snow throughout the winter. We get a couple of big storms, generally speaking. Um, in the spring, especially in eastern Colorado, that's where we're going to get our wettest period, and the storms start to slow. So as the air temperatures warm, the uh, air is going to move more slowly, and then um, the air currents start to change, and we're going to start losing that moisture from the Pacific, and air is going to come up from the south, from like the Gulf of Mexico. So that's going to bring us into summer and fall, where all this moisture from southern ranges, the Gulf of Mexico, is going to move up into Colorado, and that's where we get our spectacular monsoons, right? So this is August. This is when we're out in the mountains collecting fungi in those monsoon seasons. All right, so let's look at temperature and precipitation for a minute. If we look at these overwhelming trends of temperatures, on the left-hand side, we have this graph, and the line in the middle is showing averages. So the blue lines below that middle line are going to be deviations cooler than normal, and the red lines above that middle line are deviations warmer, warmer than normal. And so there's a little gray line that's following through here, and you can see that increase there. And this is kind of the same thing. So what they've done is they've averaged temperatures over um, from the 1890s, 1900s through the 2000s to come up with the average, and then they're mapping on the oscillations between that. So in both of these analyses, what we're seeing is there's an overall increase in temperature, which we know. Now, if we look at precipitation, if we look at these two graphs, same thing. The On the left graph, the line through the middle is showing our averages. Below that is showing decrease from average. The green on top is showing increase from average. And this is the same information over here. So while we're not seeing a, a massive change, if we look at the graph on the right, we're seeing a 0 0.01 decrease in precipitation per decade. So that doesn't seem that big, but if we put these two pictures together, we have an increase in temperature and a decrease in moisture. So that increase in temperature is exacerbating that decrease in moisture. And if we start to look at the snowpack, 
Snowpack's really important in Colorado. That's where most of our water comes from. If we look at the trends in snowpack, we're also seeing this pretty massive decrease in snowpack. And these um, maps are showing the kind of from the North Pole, right? So that the top is Russia and the bottom is Canada in, the, in these images, right? So that's gonna be Russia, down here is gonna be Canada. And what they did was they averaged snowpack from 1981 to 2010, and they compared the averages of 1975 to 1980 on the top row, and then 2000s. And so the blue is showing an increase in snowpack and the brown red is showing a decrease in snowpack. So you can see that in the late 2000s or 2010s, we're seeing a decrease in snowpack. And why that's significant is because of albedo. So albedo is the fraction of light that's reflected. So if we look at areas that are covered in snow, the sun is reflected 80 to five, 85 to 90% of the sun is reflected off snow and only 10 to 15% is absorbed. If we look at dry land without snow, 70% of sunlight is absorbed and only 20% is reflected. So that means that the ground is getting way, way hotter without snow. And over here, we're seeing um, that's on water, about 10% of sun is reflected off water. So if we tie that into the trends in the snowpack, we're seeing an overall decrease in snowpack. And it's not just for Colorado, it's for the whole Western US. And it's not just for the whole Western US, it's all places with snow. So we know that snow melts, creates water, and so that water is not making it into our rivers. So um, we're getting water shortages from that. We're getting a decrease in albedo. So there's less solar radiation or reflection. So that means that ground and air temperatures and water temperatures are increasing and that the snow when it's melting or rain is evaporating. So we have this sublimation effect when um, it's so hot, the snow doesn't melt, it just evaporates. So that's decreasing water as well. And over a sixth of the globe depends on snow melt. So this is a worldwide problem. So we're seeing decreases in snowpack and albedo, increases in temperature and evaporation, which is decreasing water availability, which we're seeing aridity around the West. Um, Lake Mead and Lake Powell are getting drained. They are tapping into the Colorado River to supplement those. And we're seeing long-term air to aridification, especially in Western North America. And so I live in the Gunnison area. This is Blue Mesa and Gunnison. So 2018 to 2021, we had a great snow year, but it's not anticipated to fill up the Mesa this year. So what does that mean for forest dynamics? How is this impacting our forests? If we look at models, we can kind of start to think about how our tree species are gonna start moving. So on the left, we see a map of aspen distribution, and on the right, we see a map of spruce distribution. And this was done by the Gunnison um, Forest Service. So this is of Gunnison. And the green is showing an increase of these tree diverse or tree distributions, and a pink is showing a decrease. And so what we can see is um, for the aspen trees, all these areas, we're going to see massive decreases, but we're going to see some increases of aspen. Um, and basically what, what this is doing, and it's, it doesn't really show it that great, is the aspens are moving up in elevation. Spruces, we're seeing kind of the same thing. So here we're seeing a decrease in spruces. There's a certain point where spruces can't move up because they're at the top. There's nowhere to go. So if we look at the classification of lost, threatened, and persistent habitats for these, the red areas are showing loss of aspen and the blue are showing emergence. So it's kind of the same idea. We're gonna see aspen move up in elevation and spruce aren't gonna be as lucky because there's just nowhere physically for them to move. So coupled with our problems are some health issues. So we've got this drought stress condition, right? So we've got increased temperatures decrease water. Trees are becoming stressed. They're not able to fight off some of their natural predators like beetles and budworms. Um, in northwest Colorado, we're seeing decreases of alpine fir. We're seeing some more um, beetle infestations. 
And if we look at the change in beetle distribution over time, this is starting, I think, from 2000 going to 2020. So we can see the spruce beetles coming in. So this is an ecological story where we did fire suppression, so there's more habitat for the beetles to live in. We did fire suppression, so there's more trees, so there's more competition. So the trees are feeling stressed from drought, from competition. They're more susceptible to beetles. So now what's about to happen? What's the next step in this story? So now we have these massive fires on the landscape, right? So we're going to see these changes in our, our, the fire regime, the forest system from the fires. Now, another part of the story is phenology. So phenology is our life history characteristics, when species complete their life cycle. So for flowers, it's going to be when they flower, when they pollinate, when they produce fruits and seeds. So if we go into herbarium records, we can use the herbarium to determine when flowering dates for, for different species over time. And so this graph is showing um, flowering dates for species in the Alpine, species in the sagebrush, and this barren river. And so what I think is really interesting about this is I would have expected to see a much bigger change in the Alpine flowering date. And there wasn't much from the 1860 to the 2000s. This gray line is showing sagebrush flowering. So we're seeing a, a significant change in the flowering date of sagebrush ecosystems in this period, which I think is kind of surprising. And if we dive into those sagebrush ecosystems, I mentioned that there's grasses um, or those habitats are being grazed and the grazing can't really support it. And so by grazing, you're changing the species competition and allowing non-native species to come in. And so there's this other aspect that we're not as in tune to is the underground dynamics that are happening. So these sagebrush ecosystems, the native plants have these incredible underground dynamics with these massive root systems that create these hydraulics. So the giant root systems allow water to be brought up to the surface and they create their own little microclimate with some moisture in there to support this diversity. So when we change those native ecosystems, we're exacerbating this drought situation because we're losing that hydraulic lift from the root systems of the native plants. So you came to talk about fungi. What about the fungi? Well, here we go. We don't have as much information about what's happening with the fungi. We do have a few studies. So what we do know is that um, these are from, um, this data is from herbarium records or fungarium records from Europe. And so we're seeing longer, um, they're using the word fruiting, but we know fungi aren't fruit. So basidiocarp and ascocarp production. We're seeing longer fruiting periods of fungi, especially in Europe. Um, and there is some difference in ecological guilds, um, but there's not a strong signal there, but just generally mushroom phenology, when mushrooms are completing their life cycle, those are changing as well. So just to recap, we see increases in stressors, we're seeing decreases in moisture, increases in temperature, which is causing increases in pests and pathogens, which is changing our fire regime. We're changing our ecosystem composition. We're shifting species ranges. We're seeing shifts in phenology. And you're like, well, this is really fun. Having a good time. So glad I came out to listen to how bad it is. But there's a ton of stuff we can still do. So, Fungi, we're here because we love the fungi. And the first thing to know is that we don't know anything. We know so little about the fungi that are out there. We have these estimates of fungal diversity. So Hawksworth started in 91 and throughout this number, 1.5 million species of fungi exist. And then sometime later, he doubled his estimate, 2.2 to 3.8 billion species of fungi. Then Wu just threw out this number, 11.7 to 13.2 million species of fungi. We don't know who's right. But if you think about it, if you take a leaf off of a plant and you chop that leaf up, 
it's going to probably have five to 10 species of fungi. If you take the guts out of an insect and chop it up and culture it, you're going to get five to 10 species of fungi. If you think about the number of insects, that's one of the largest, that's the most diverse group of animals. And we have no idea of the fungal diversity that infects insects or is symbiotic with insects. So who knows what the real diversity is? What we do know is we have about 150,000 described species. So at most, we know 10% of the fungi. And what this graph is on the bottom is the number of fungal species described per year. So you can see there's we're on this exponential rise. There's so much more fungi out there to be explored. And we're here at the Denver Botanic Gardens at the Sam Mitchell Herbarium of Fungi. And there is Sam. He's a medical doctor and collected fungi, and he put it in an herbarium. And that is one of the best resources we have for understanding fungal diversity. So we can use these natural history collections. They're usually dried fungi, and it provides this tremendous source of data. So we can study phenology. When the fungi were out, where were they? We can understand species distributions, species ranges. We can use that to understand, are those species distributions changing? Are the ranges changing? The information contained within the fungi, there's DNA. So with the DNA, we can study the evolution. How are these species evolving? We can understand the genes, their gene products from within there. And we can even use some of the chemistry that's in them um, to understand metabolites and maybe be able to use those for different um, industrial applications or even uh, other applications. From the information that was contained within the Sam Mitchell Herbarium, Vera was able to write her two books, but based on her collections, all the fungi that's represented in those books are contained with that herbarium. So we have this tr tremendous natural history record by collecting and saving fungi. And we have these awesome folks that are down there doing the work. Um, we've got Ed and his wife, Akiko, and Linnea. There's Vera in there. So um, the, it's just a tremendous resource to have. And since um, Dr. Anna Wilson has come on board, we've been collecting fungi in Colorado. And I know that it's 2019. I He's out of town, so I wasn't able to get more recent numbers. But um, the number of collections that we've been able to accession into the Sam Mitchell Herbarium in the last few years has also exploded. So if you're interested in looking at these natural history collections, what you can do is go into MycoPortal, which is a website and it's freely available. Um, and what you can do is you go up to this search button can't really see what I'm doing. It should say search collections. And here's a list of all the natural history collections that house fungi. So if you're looking for a certain species of fungi or trying to figure out where they've been found or where they collected, you can go in here. So for this example, what I've done is I've unselected everything and we're just gonna go into the Denver Botanic Gardens. And we're gonna search their collections and we're gonna search what do we have from Colorado in this collection? And 18,000 fungal collections from Colorado. And so what we're gonna do is let's look at where they're distributed. So here we have a map of the distribution of fungal collections within Colorado. And that one's not totally accurate. Um, this is the more accurate map. So here we have a pretty cool distribution. We can see where fungi has been collected, where it's housed. The other tremendous resource that we have is iNaturalist. So using iNaturalist, we can do the same thing. Let's see what people have documented for fungi in Colorado. So we're gonna explore fungi. And I really wish they would separate lichens out. But if we search for Colorado, lichens are fungi. Here's our distribution of fungal collections in Colorado. Now, let's compare those. What's missing? We have no collections from Eastern Colorado, hardly any, and also from the sagebrush habitats 
there's very, very little collections. Does that mean there's no fungi there? No, we don't go there because it's not as exciting as the mountains, right? We love going in the forest. We love seeing stuff, um, the trees, the mountains at all. But the, those sagebrush habitats are pretty threatened, really. Like they're changing very dramatically. They're changing in our lifetime. So I'm just going to spend a minute hyping our desert fungi, which it's arid adapted species is a better name. So there's all kinds of cool fungi that grow in sand. And if you're like me, every time you see something growing in sand, you might think of this. Oh, it's not playing the sound. Damn it. Well, that is from Raising Arizona. And what they're saying is, when there was no more food to eat, we ate sand. And Nick Cage goes, you ate sand? We ate sand. Um, it's funnier if it plays. But <laughs> so anytime I'm out in the desert and I see one of these guys, I'm like, you eat sand? What are you eating? The vast majority of these fungi are, um, they're not lamellate, they're not gilled, right? So when you think of a mushroom, you think of the cap and the gills. Well, over evolutionary time, what we've seen is this change to a secotioid form and to this gastroid form. So in this secotioid form, what we have is this cap didn't open. So those that like gray area in there is all these modeled gills. And then that was just an evolutionary trajectory to this where it's completely enclosed. And so in the gastroid, you're not, you're barely going to see any remnants of any gills. It's just going to be some of these pieces of tissue called capillitia or hyphal strands. And what's really cool about this gastroid form is um, this super easy to read diagram is telling us that this gastroid form evolved at least 123 times. So many, many times. So this is just a tremendous example of convergent evolution, right? So What's up? Since the dawn of time. <laughs> you know, I don't know that answer off the top of my head, and I should. Um, right, so we see this divergence of Agarica myocatina to about 200 million years ago. So it, it's way back here. Um, so this is this. Phylogenetic tree was the basis of a lot of different studies. Obviously, it's, it's a tremendous amount of information, very, very deeply buried in there. Um, but only one of the things that they were looking at was this diversification rate of mushroom morphology, meaning that the shape of the mushroom. Is it lamellate? Is it stip does it have a stipe? Does it have a cap? Is it resupinate? Is it like a crust? That sort of stuff. Um, the other interesting thing about this is once you go gastroid, you never come back. It's irreversible, right? You are gastroid, you're not gonna develop gills again. You're not gonna evolve back. Um, and so the other thing that I think is really interesting, if, if you've ever seen the videos, that if you're talking about a basidiomycete, we have that structure that makes spores called a basidia. And if it's on gills, you're gonna have forcible discharge. If you're enclosed, it doesn't make sense to be forcibly discharged because you've not got anywhere to go. You're just going to stay inside. So none of them have forcible discharge. So what they have to do is rely on some other physical thing to disperse spores. And we've all had fun with this, right? Tapping on a puffball, exploding the spores. And some of them have gotten really ingenious about it. So if we look at the gastroid um, earth stars, Astraeus, is very well adapted to waiting for moisture to disperse its spores. So it waits till it's there's enough water. At that point, it's gonna open up its arms. And then eventually, once it's open, those arms are gonna reflex, lift it up. So it knows that there's water, so those spores will disperse. So fungi are cognizant as well. So if we start to look at these, um, We've got Podaxis pistillaris. If you've ever seen this mushroom, it's likely that you called it Podaxis pistillaris. Or maybe not. So 
But no, you're, look at this. You're like, I'm not going out there to look for mushrooms, right? That's not a mushroom habitat. But if we start to look at Podaxis, there's actually a ton of species of this funky little mushroom hiding under one name. So there really is tremendous diversity out there. So they looked at, uh, they collected and they used fungarium specimens to build a phylogenetic tree, which is showing the evolution of a group of mushrooms and the different colors are showing that these are different species. And this is just from South Africa. And when folks threw in collections from different areas, we're starting to see even more diversity. So that brings us to Telostoma. So the stocked puffball, right? So when I first found Telostoma and Gunnison, it, it's pretty distinctive as a genus. It's very easy to get to genus. The only other stock puffball that you'll probably find around here is Batarea. And if we look at the global diversity of these two, Batarea depends on who you talk to and what information. I People might go up to five species. There's probably two or three. So when I first found Telostoma, I was like, oh, well, it's going to be like Batarea. There's not a lot of diversity. It'll be easy to identify. And then I dug into the literature and was very surprised because their spore morphology was fantastic. And then there's this crazy oddball that's found um, in Southeast Asia. I didn't find it in my master's degree work. This one's from Singapore. It's Telostoma exasperatum. Just looks, that exoperidium is just spectacular. And then when I dug into the literature too, so we've got 61 different species that are reported from North America. And their center of diversity is in these arid habitats. So New Mexico has the center of diversity. So I spent several years looking at these fungi, borrowing collections from different fungarium, built a phylogenetic tree with my collections combined with published data. And out of the 61 reported, I was only able to find about 15 species that were have been reported. Um, in those 15 species of the 61, we, we have a couple new ones, still working on getting them published. Um, but these are the habitats that they grow in. So again, we're not out there collecting in these habitats, but we should be, right? Because we know these habitats are changing. We know they're getting impacted from climate change. We know that the species diversity is affecting them. They're also subject to habitat degradation, right? And one of the biggest issues is anthropogenic development. So, Anything that we see, we can be documenting and being outside in any habitat is important. So using those tools to document fungi, it's just gonna enable us to better study. So I'm not saying you have to focus in the desert areas. There's still plenty of work and diversity that we need to understand in our spectacular mountains. There's tons of species complexes. So if you're talking to a, professional mycologists, they might say something like, oh, we call that hygrosophy conica. And we use that distinction to indicate it's not its real name. We know that it's something else. We just haven't put the right name on it. There's a lot more work to be done. So there's probably many, many species hiding under a name. And you'll hear lots of people say, well, we call it this. And that's just code for we're gonna put that name on it. It's not totally right. We don't. We only have X number of years in our life. We're never gonna get that group figured out, but somebody should. This is another good example of why I really like looking at stuff um, or using collections to better understand our diversity. So on the left-hand side, it's a Cortinarius. So if you know Cortinarius, you probably have just thrown it because they're very, very hard to identify. And if you were to see these next to each other, it, you would be hard pressed to ever differentiate them. The spores are the same size, their habitat, they're all snowbank court areas, so they grow in the same place at the same time, very close to each other. Micromorphology, it's very difficult to tell apart. If you build a phylogeny, you can see some difference in the genetics, but that doesn't help you in the field. But here is a new technique to use UV light to distinguish these quaternary species. And that shows some very distinct differences. So also in these Rocky Mountain habitats that we like to look at, 
Burn Ground is a, a great resource to finding new diversity. So we have um, recent work in Rocky Mountain National Park looked at burned fungi. So there's a whole suite of fungi that love, love burn ground. They're pyrophilus. So exact same thing that we've seen. Species that look very similar. They looked into them. They built a phylogeny and discovered, oh, there's four species hiding under one species name. So even in fungi that we know that are well documented, there are still a ton of diversity out there. Continuing to find these fungi can also lead to habitat restoration, right? So we have all these different um, pressures that are coming to our forest. So if we know the fungi, we can utilize them for better habitat restoration. So pyrophilus fungi are a great example. So we, we know fires are coming. If a fire comes through, what happens is, especially when it's super hot, all that plant material, when it burns really hot, turns into this waxy, waxy layer and it makes the soil hydrophobic. So the water, the moisture can't get in there. So we're changing these soil dynamics. So to break up these, fungi are some of those first early colonizers that come in after fungi or fire. And what's really cool is the pyrophilus fungi, those fungi that are adapted to come in after a fire, change the soil chemistry. So what we're seeing on the right-hand side is some work by Kathy Cripps and her grad student, Olivia, who looked at soil aggregation. So what they're able to do is aggregate soil, break down that waxy layer, make it more penetrable for water so that the succession can start to move along. So utilizing fungi for habitat restoration is a great resource. And um, even if you have one species, one individual collection, it doesn't really tell you the whole story. So Dr. Sarah Bronco, who's in the room, is working on Suillus, which is slippery jacks, um, which is a mycorrhizal fungus. And so they're finding that different populations have different tolerances to metals. So what you can see on the, the there's a Suillus luteus on the left, and there's a picture of the um, mycorrhizae on the roots here. And then over here, what we're looking at are two different populations of the same species, and they just came from different areas. And the different individuals of the same species have differential susceptibility to metals. Some are tolerant, some are intolerant, and they're working on the whole complicated genome that's responsible for that. So even just collecting one species does not tell us the whole picture. So if you're interested in conservation efforts, um, we've got some groups that are working on it. There's a International Fungal Conservation Committee with the IUCN. And then the Fungal Diversity Survey is another North American organization that's really working hard to documenting our fungal diversity in North America. So what you can do is keep collecting. Document your observations. You can document them on iNaturalist. You can document them on Mushroom Observer. Even better, if you can collect, uh, connect with local natural history collections, support natural history collections, <clears throat> because fungarium specimens, collecting and storing fungi is really important to our ability to understand fungal biodiversity. It, the information that are stored in there um, is invaluable. You can't get it back. You can't recreate biodiversity history without an actual documented specimen. and. One of the most positive things about an increase in human population is that increased human populations have a positive impact on fungaria record collections. So if we look at increased human populations, we see more fungi. So that's great news. And then there's all kinds of information that we don't even know about. So Richard Tahan is working on um, Ophiocordyceps, like entomopathic fungi, and one of the limitations of fungarium collections is that DNA breaks down over time. So after a certain amount of time, you're not going to be able to get usable DNA out of that collection. But there's other resources in there. So he's most recently extracted um, different chemical profiles and is able to use herbarium specimens from over 100 years ago to use in his evolutionary reconstruction by looking at the chemistry because the DNA was too degraded. 
And it's only 2023. Who knows what technology is coming down the line? Who knows what we can, what information we can gather out of these Fungarian collections? So we can under, get genomics, we can understand genes, we can understand evolutionary uh, relationships, we can rebuild evolutionary histories, we can discover novel compounds, we can understand the biochemistry. These collections are great for understanding biodiversity. Perhaps there's industrial applications. We can use it for habitat restoration. We can monitor species distribution. So just trying to drive home the point that these Fungarian collections are really important and that everybody is capable of this level of science. So thank you very much. And I, I'll take questions. I would turn the lights up, but there's a lot of buttons and I don't know which one. <laughs> Let's see. We want... Um, is that... Can I answer any questions for anybody? Yeah. They're they're all their own deal. So some are just going to be in fan, some are going to be associated with other things. Generally, there has to be some amount of work. So like right now, springtime, especially if we started getting some last spring rains, would be perfect time to look for those. And I kind of think about it like it's a little bit before I would start looking for snow banks as well. So if I was going to snow bank is late May, early June, so a little bit before that, you might go out and go get some snow. And of course, it's it's never as prolific as August in the mountains, but mm -hmm. I find it pretty special to find those. Yeah. Those uh, important areas seem to look over by the Sorry, I forgot about Zoom. The question was the Cortinarius, was it under short or long wave? And um, I don't know the number, it's, is it 560? Is that, anybody know that? Okay. The, Ed's saying 250. That um, paper was published by Joe Amirati and Kathy Cripps, um, and it's uh, section Telomonia cortinaria. So if you look up that paper, it will be in there. I think, yeah. Talk about the trees moving to higher elevations. Are we assuming that the mycorrhizal fungi are following, or might they create new associations with different species? So the question is, as fungi move up, or as trees move up in elevation, are the fungi coming? And the answer is, they, the trees are gonna need mycorrhizal partners to be able to succeed. We don't know, because we don't have really good distribution maps to begin with. So there are some folks, like the SPUN network is working on mapping mycorrhizal or just soil fungi diversity and distributions, but, we don't really know how that's going to work. So some of Kathy Cripp's work is also looking at Sewillus and how it works with uh, white bark pine, because that's another threatened species. We don't really have it. It's further north. But showing that um, her work has shown that using specific mycorrhizal fungi are going to improve the tree health, herbivory resistance, all beetle resistance, all that kind of stuff. And so Right now, the Forest Service uses kind of this generic mycorrhizal slurry when they're growing fungi. They're not using a targeted approach, and it's you know it's pretty complex, so it'd be hard to understand that. Um, so the short answer is we don't know. We don't know what the um, the studies on like spore dispersal, how far do spores move, how long do they live in the soil, that sort of stuff. You know, there's there's some data out there. They don't seem to go, move too, too far, um, especially the mycorrhizal species. So we hope so. 
But if we have that information, that's something that we can use. If, if we know stuff is moving, can we help it out? Can we provide it with its symbiotic partner to help it survive its big move? Yeah. A Zoom question. What sort of recent adaptations to increasing aridity have been observed in non gas rivers? Uh, the question is what innovations have non gasteroid fungi developed to deal with aridity? I, I don't know, because if we're thinking about evolution, we're looking at these huge time scales. We could think about spores, right? So we've got melanized spores, thick walled spores. Maybe that's to deal with aridity. Maybe that's to uh, pass through an animal or attach to something else. Um, if you think about it, the mushroom is kind of the short-lived part. The, the hyphae, the mycelium are, is what's the long-lived part. So there's chitinous cell walls and all these different um, biochemicals on the outside of the hyphae that can perhaps be produced to deal with aridity. But that, that's a long scale, or, you know, evolution's a long time period. So I don't know um, how much people have looked into that. All right. Yeah. Area, area. You can talk about the right now. What would you suggest? Do you have a cell phone? Yeah. Do you have iNaturalist on it? Load it up. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll volunteer. Andy's not here, so I'll volunteer. You can send it to Andy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so iNaturalist is great because it, it's a, a document of it. Having the collection is better. What the cool thing about the desert fungi is, is oftentimes you don't have to dry them, right? Like the telostoma is, I just, I can put them on my dash. They're not going to mold. They're going to be fine, right? And they're not going to change color really when they dry. So that's kind of the fun thing about some of these arid adapted species is they, their morphology, their colors, that sort of thing doesn't really change because they're already pretty crispy. In the back. Oh, so um, how am I magic? The, I teach for the Botany and Plant Pathology Department for Oregon State for their eCampus program. In Crested Butte, I'm working on developing the Crested Butte Botanic Gardens. So um, that that's what my jam is right now. It doesn't exist yet. We're taking donations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you for listening. I hope I gave you some hope. Um, 